Um, and the first thing I would say is that I'm not a digital creative entrepreneur, but I do work uh, with digital creative entrepreneurs. Um, and I have done um, for the past sort of three or four years or so. Um, and my background very much is in uh, understanding people, teams, resilience, how to get the best out of people. And I think it's something that I personally have found absolutely fascinating, the psychology behind it. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more later on, but really for the last 20 years, I've been coaching, training, mentoring people. Something I thought I'd first sort of throw out there is that um, we don't just draw inspiration, knowledge and strength from our own industries. Often it's from other areas. And I think it's quite important sometimes to remember that. Um, and so what I'm going to sort of caveat is that what I cover today is very much from personal experience, it's my observation, study um, and coaching people and organisations. So I'm going to start out with, um, with a story about how someone helped me build my own resilience. Um, and so in 2008, I was in the army and I was asked to take a team of 30 people to Afghanistan for counterinsurgency operations. So before going out, I felt this overwhelming worry that I would make a decision that would then get someone uh, severely injured or killed. And it's something that really I spent a lot of time worrying about. So I thought to myself, what can I actually do about this? And so I started speaking to people to get advice, thoughts, people who'd been through similar situations. And someone said to me, um, if you make a decision in good faith, you can't blame yourself. And it really, really resonated with me. And I thought it's it's such an important thing that actually, if at any given point in time, I make a decision that I genuinely believe is the right, uh, right decision with the information I have, I've been planned, prepared, spoken to people for advice, I can't blame myself. And what that did, it took a huge weight off my shoulders and it freed up a lot of my sort of thinking time. So even beforehand in the build up, the worry was less, obviously I was still concerned, um, but then even when I was out there in Afghanistan, it made a big difference. And I would always just think to myself that if, um, if I was ever worried. Um, and I think it made a big difference with my decision making processes and also the rest of the team, how it impacted them. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the situation and the environment hadn't actually changed. It was still a counterinsurgency. My mindset had. And I think it's such an important thing just to think about as we go through all of this, it's about mindset. And whether you're thinking about the individual, the team, uh, the business, just thinking what you can do to actually try and affect your mindset. So what we're going to do, is I'm probably going to go for about 30 minutes or so, then we've got some Q&A. Um, and uh, a bit of it in background about me. So as you'll realize, I was in the army for 12 years. I then joined a tech consulting company um, and then I started up uh, my own company, uh, which is called 1807. Um, and we coach people. So we do career coaching, we do business coaching, we do some life coaching as well. Um, and it's the idea is that we help people along, along their journeys. I also am a deal maker uh, on the Global Entrepreneur Program, which is part of the uh, Department for International Trade, with a main focus on Latin America. Um, so what we try we do is we help uh, we help uh, scale up innovative companies uh, come to the UK relocate their headquarters to the UK and the sport we provide is coaching mentoring introductions um, understanding different ecosystems um, and that's something I've been doing for the last just over the, the last year so I split my time between half and half. So I'm sure many of you will be um, very familiar with the word resilience, um, and this is what we're going to cover. Um, and the aim of this is to get you to understand what resilience is, why it's important, and to take action, to do things to build your resilience. And there are things you can do that make a difference. There's obviously a lot of, lot of lap over between the individual, the team and the business. And uh, I think it's important to sort of look at it as a whole, but also then look at it individually as well. Please do feel free to get in touch after the webinar. Uh, I'm very happy to connect, answer any questions. So what is resilience? I think it's really important. This was um, McKinsey um, came up with this uh, quote back in April. 
Um, and I think it's really important just to think about resilience in different ways, in terms of business, in terms of yourself. And as creative entrepreneurs, no doubt you have had failures, you've had tough times, but you've come through the other side. And thinking about resilience, again, it's an ability to regulate thoughts, emotions, as well as perceiving challenging situations as an opportunity and not necessarily a personal threat. Things are going to happen that we don't want to happen. That is a given. COVID-19, a year ago, no one saw it. Bill Gates did give, um, uh, uh, I think it was a TED talk or an interview where he did say the next global challenge would be a pandemic. And that was back in 2015. But I think it's really important just to think about resilience. Obviously, there's lots of different um, uh, meanings of it and it means different things. But I think it's really just preparing yourself and being able to cope and thrive um, in difficult situations. So why is resilience important? Um, I think it's particularly important with creative businesses because it affects every single area of your business from the people to teams to business functions and so having resilience as a strategic initiative having a plan for individuals the teams and the business is something that is of high importance and again a few benefits on the side here from various studies that have happened but again having it as resilience as a strategic initiative initiative what I'd like you to do is just have a little think now about times when you feel you have been resilient in the past. It could be childhood, it could be early adulthood, it could be education, jobs, but just have a little think about it and maybe have a think about how that affected you and what you did, how you built that resilience. So thinking about the personal side of things um we've got a, a quote here from the national health service uh, which is stresses the feeling of being under too much mental or emotional pressure pressure turns into stress when you feel unable to cope and people have different ways of reacting uh, to stress and i think understanding what it is understanding why you're feeling stressed is a is an important thing and we've got a slide that i'll come on to that in a little bit and I think it's a really important point that resilience isn't the absence of stress, but it's the ability to cope and ideally thrive um, with that stress. As creative entrepreneurs, you will have had stressful situations, pressure. And the funny thing about stress is that it's 100% self-imposed. So you are the only person who can impose um, impose that stress on yourself. Other people may be able to do things or say things to you, um, but you're the only one who can actually physically make yourself feel stressed. Now, there's a great quote uh, that sort of backs that up, which is by Eleanor Roosevelt, which is, remember, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And so it comes back to this mindset. It's such an important element. And thinking about the personal side of things, uh, work affects um, your life outside work and life affects work and so it's just thinking about it as a whole so not just in work but outside work and look at all as aspects at a personal level. Now there is a, a picture I've got here of someone called Terry Waite um, so he was captured uh, he was a I think he was a hostage negotiator and he was captured in Beirut in Lebanon in 1987 um, and uh, he was in captivity for almost five years. So 1,763 days, um, to be precise, that he was kidnapped. It's quite a long time, and you can imagine the stress, the pressure of that. It was four years, of the first four years, he was in uh, solitary confinement on his own. And so what he did, he came up with a coping strategy to help himself get through this. And what it was that each day he'd wake up and he'd pretend one of his children was there and he'd play, pretend play with that child all day long. And then the next day he'd do it with his other children. And I think it's really interesting to think, what can you do to try and build that resilience, to get through tough times? So I think sometimes it's nice to have a bit of reflection, talk, um, and just think about what you can actually do. Um, there's another, well, one of the, creative um, CEOs um, that I'm doing some work with at the moment, um, his 
what he likes to do um, is, and he says this sets him up and it doesn't matter how tough the day is going to be, but if he can get into this routine, it sets him up for the day. So what he likes to do, he likes to get up at four o'clock in the morning. He likes to then meditate for a few hours. Then that sets up his entire day and he, he doesn't feel as though he's uh, stressed, constantly fighting fires. He says, conversely, if it doesn't happen, he knows he can tell the difference um, a lot. And I think it's just understanding what works for you and what works yeah, for you as an individual. So what we've got here is a bit more on the personal side of things. And what I'll start with is the human needs, emotions and behaviours. And again, this is where the sort of understanding stress comes in. So as human beings, we have basic human needs. We need to be loved, we need belonging, we need um, security, we need shelter, food, water, etc. So those are basic human needs that we all have. Whether those are being met or not comes out in our emotions, our feelings and our thoughts. And this is the mindset part. And those will then become positive or negative emotions. Those positive and negative emotions then come out in our behavior. Now, the interesting thing is that our behavior can then affect our need, our human needs and also our feelings to what goes around. So by intersecting some of these things, for example, behavior, you can then affect other things. Now, what's really interesting is that it's only the behavior that you can see, that you can physically see in yourself and also recognizing it in others. But again, behind those behaviors, their emotions and their needs. And I think it's really important to understand that and think about how you might be able to intercept things at a personal level to help yourself through this, but also recognizing it in other people. Now, um, there's something that's a term that um, my company's come up with is something called authentic confidence. Um, and when people build this, we see that they thrive more, they're happier more, and they can cope with setbacks even more. So, what it is, it is it's a belief in yourself and a belief in what you've got to offer what you've achieved and what you can do recognizing potential shortcomings but not letting them hold you back but knowing where you want to go knowing what your values are knowing what's important to you and there are things that you can do to try and affect this and again time for reflection i think is important and doing work on oneself is always um, very very beneficial i personally think so i think just thinking who you are, what you stand for, what you can do and what you've done in the past. Now, um, there's something else that's called uh, limiting self-beliefs, which you may or may not have heard about. Um, and these are things that we tell ourselves. It's our internal monologue. I'll highlight that they're not truths, but they are beliefs that we hold about ourselves. Now, the uh, National Science Foundation um, is a foundation based in the UK um, and they reckon an average person has between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts per day. They also reckon that 80% of those are negative thoughts, so that's eight zero, and that 95% are repetitive thoughts. So you can see if you start telling yourself you're in internal monologue starts telling yourself these things over and over and over again, you start to believe that they're true. Um, various um, examples might be, I'm not good enough, I don't have enough experience, I'm not a good leader, I've never done it before. Uh, imposter syndrome is, is a common uh, example of this as well. And in my experience, limiting self-beliefs start rising up and start coming to the fore more in people's minds when times are tough. So what we have here is a little tool just to look at these limiting self-beliefs um, in a different way, just to challenge them. So to give you an example of what happened, I was um, uh, speaking with um, the CEO um, of another creative company, um, really impressive guy, and I asked him if he had any limiting self-beliefs. And he said that his limiting self-belief was, excuse me, was that he didn't think he deserved to be successful. So I then asked him, what is the cost to you of believing that limiting self-belief? That you are not, you don't deserve to be successful. And he went through saying that he spent a lot of time thinking about it. He didn't like thinking about it. It would sometimes hold him back. And so you're thinking that actually the cost of having, believing these or having these thoughts is actually really quite high. 
So I then asked him to imagine that he was in a court where there's a judge and a jury, and he had to present hard evidence that he didn't deserve to be successful, that his limiting self-belief was true. And there was nothing. There was not one single piece of evidence. The only thing was that he remembers when he was seven years old, he was in uh, school and he was playing up a bit as kids do. And the teacher took him aside and said, you don't deserve to be successful. And with all those tens of thousands of thoughts over the days, months, weeks, years, that had confounded. And again, it's very, very common for things like this to happen. But I think challenging it is such an important uh, thing. And so what I'd urge you to do is have a think to yourself. Do you have any, um, any limiting self-beliefs? You may not necessarily realize, but I think have a look. And I would go through this little exercise, work out what the cost is to you and then look for hard proof that your limiting self-belief is true. And almost every single time I do this with people, there is either very, very flimsy evidence or zero evidence at all. So here's just a few things, some practical things you can do on a personal level. You may well know some of them or all of them, but I thought I'd highlight them um, again, that um, it's easy to let things slip. So the mindset, as I've mentioned already, learning, growing is so important. There's a book by someone called Martin Seligman, uh, which is called Learned Optimism, which is all about the benefits of being optimistic, all about not being negative. And I think it's a really important thing when it comes to resilience, that if you feel you're unlucky, this always happens to you, you tend to be less successful. And he goes into detail about the benefits of being optimistic and seeing opportunities. And so that's really just a, uh, to highlight the whole mindset even further. <coughs> Second one, understanding emotional intelligence in yourself and others. Communication, I think, is such an absolutely vital part of looking after yourself. It really is. Um, there is, a, or there was about, I think it was the, within the last sort of 10, 15 years or so, the American military conducted an exercise, a huge exercise, and it was all about unmanned vehicles. So you had unmanned, uh, well, not quite unmanned, you had, they were trying to see um, how few people they could use with as many uh, automated vehicles. And so they would get people on their own in tanks, well, there's normally sort of four people in a tank, they would isolate people on their own who were in charge of lots of different vehicles uh, when they were going through this exercise. The resounding thing, um, finding, was that it didn't work. Because people in isolation on their own, generally speaking, they didn't like it. They liked having that personal interaction with other people. And I think it's such an important thing to speak about things. And I know there's old adage, a problem shared is a problem halved. But I think it's such an important thing just to be able to speak about things with other people. There's been lots of done uh, research done on journaling, writing journaling, actually getting your thoughts out uh, on how that helps relieve stress and get it out of the body. Obviously, we all know we need to exercise, sleep well, and eat healthily. Showing appreciation and helping others, again, is an important one because it makes us feel better in ourselves. And so I think that then increases um, yeah, how we feel about ourselves, which then in turn increases resilience. Pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. So in the bottom right photograph is someone, a lady called Tina Selig, who is a professor of entrepreneurship at, um, at Stanford University. And she's got a TED talk that I'd highly recommend um, uh, watching and it's about how to um, how to increase your luck and she says she studied this for 20 years she studied luck entrepreneurship and I think it's quite relevant in this situation now with COVID-19 but also with um, building resilience for other things that might happen that we can't anticipate, anticipate so the three things she says that you can do to increase your luck is number one um, you can push yourself outside of your comfort zone. Number two is show appreciation. And number three is your whole notion about how you go about viewing ideas. Now, to go into a bit more detail about that, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, the example she gives is that she was on an airplane 
um, and uh, she so thought to herself, Do you know, I'm just going to slightly push myself outside of my comfort zone and start talking to the person next to me. So she started talking to the next uh, man sitting next to her. Anyway, it turns out that he was in publishing and they were chatting, carrying on. And after 10, 15 minutes, she said to him, uh, I've actually written a book and I would love you to, uh, to have a look at that and just give me your thoughts. So she gets her laptop out, shows him and he has a look through and says, you know, it's not quite what we do at the moment, but um, you know, it looks interesting um, and leaves it at that. A couple of months later, she invites him to come and speak to her students at Stanford University, um, her entrepreneur, um, entrepreneurship students. And he comes along, gives a presentation um, and then chats with them afterwards and loves some of the ideas they're doing and starts talking about maybe they can do uh, some collaboration with a book. And of course, she's there thinking, hmm, feeling a bit jealous here. Anyway, fast forward a couple of few more months and um, he comes again uh, to speak to the students and he brings one of his colleagues um, and she starts speaking to one of his colleagues and uh, they're talking and he says, you know, what is absolutely fascinating. Um, have you ever thought about writing a book? And she says, well, funny you should say that. Anyway, long story short, a million copies later, she looks back and she thinks, the first step of this entire process was me just having that little step, speaking to someone, pushing myself outside my comfort zone, just pushing myself out and speaking to somebody. That was that first step that had set that whole trail off. Second thing, showing appreciation, but giving reasons why appreciation. So thank you for your help and support in the last two days, for example. Um, and again, as I said, it helps you, makes you feel better, and it tends to increase um, how you view yourself and then resilience. The third thing, which I think is important really now in this, where we are now um, with the pandemic, is your whole idea about how you view ideas. So what she does is with her students, she gets them all to write down bad business ideas, businesses that they think will fail. So they write them down, put them into a hat, and then um, mix them around, and then each person picks someone else's um, out of that. Once they pick them out, she says to them, right, you now have to turn that bad business idea into a viable business. The example she gives with this is that someone had written down a dirty restaurant. Um, and so the person who picked it out thought, right, how can I look at this in a different way? So he started looking at it at different angles, they came up with was that they could come up with a, a dirty restaurant that was a training ground for health and safety officers. So I think having a think about things in different ways, and I'm sure it's very common what people are doing now and during a pandemic, but just thinking how you can view things in different ways. So we're now going to move on to a little bit um, about teams. So there's someone called uh, Rich Fernandez, who's the CEO of the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. So this was a not-for-profit, started at Google, um, and it's all about leadership, well-being, looking after yourself. And they go around and they help uh, organizations. Now, he says there's five things you can do to boost your resilience at work. First one, exercise mindfulness. And examples of this, and he cites various research that backed it up, improved judgment, problem solving, cognitive flexibility, and decreasing employee stress. The second one is to compartmentalize your cognitive load. So this is when you're moving between tasks, doing one task, so for example, writing an email, then going to a brainstorming session, is to actively have that space of time or to break away from what you're previously doing to then focus completely on the next one. And the research that he cites is that your productivity can be reduced by up to 40% if you don't compartmentalize your cognitive load. Taking detachment breaks, again, this research that he cites um, can promote greater energy, mental clarity, creativity and focus, ultimately growing our capacity for resilience. Developing mental agility, being mentally agile and decentering stress when it occurs. And one of the things is if you talk about your emotions and the stress by labeling them and giving them words, you active, uh, uh, you activate um, the, um, you don't activate the emotional side of your, of your brain. So by actually labeling it, it sort of take, you take mentally take a step back. 
Um, and obviously, it's a valuable skill to have in demanding workplaces, in creative workplaces, wherever you are. Cultivating compassion. Again, research he cites increases positive emotion, positive relationships, and increases cooperation and collaboration. So more on the team and some things to consider here, the team mindset. As digital creative entrepreneurs, how can you affect it? How can you affect your people to then affect their work, to then affect the business? Communication, absolutely vital. And a really interesting um, thing was ha uh, happened the other day that I was uh, one of the CEOs that I coach. Um, he said he asked his company, so the team of about, I think, uh, yes, of 12, 13, 14 people, he asked them what the company vision was. And some of them weren't quite clear on what it was. And so he thought to himself, do you know what? This is so important. I need to get this across that everybody needs to understand. So what he's doing, he's going to come up with, he's going to visualize his vision. So he's not going to use words. He's going to visualize it. And I think he hasn't quite decided whether it's going to be through a video or whether it's going to be through an animation or through, um, through a painting or whatever it might be. But I just thought it's interesting that first of all, it's so clear to understand that you as entrepreneurs, your team understands what are you actually, what is your vision? Is it clear what you're trying to do? And double checking. Learning, encouraging learning, obviously throughout the team, and it starts with yourselves as, as the heads of your organizations. Recognizing that everybody counts. You never know when someone will just be able to make that difference. And I, th I think by communicating, understanding people, people understanding what your vision is, there's then a higher chance that they can make affect that change. Reflective and active listening, which you may or may not have heard of, but active listening is all about being really listening to the other person, not wanting to get your point across, understanding them, listening to them, repeating back what they've said to make sure that you understand it. And again, it's linked to how every person counts. Again, people, how you look after your team is such an important uh, thing to do, particularly during tough times. Having a team plan, who's going to be informed, who's going to be consulted about the team plan and the individual plan and potentially even the business plan, and who's going to be responsible for it. So there's, uh, there was a study done uh, in 2016 uh, of high school students in America. And it was uh, students that they were learning about um, famous, um, famous people and what they've done. So people like Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, and they split uh, the students into two, two groups. And the first group only learned about the successes that they had, how wonderful they were, what they'd done, and what the resounding impact was. So that's the first group. The second group, they learned, as well as the um, achievements, they learned about how they struggled intellectually, how they made mistakes in investigating scientific problems, how they struggled personally, how there was poverty, how there was lack of parental support. And it turns out that those second group who find out about the struggles, they realize it didn't just come naturally. It motivated them more. And I think understanding these things, understanding there are good times, there's bad, people have had tough times, as I'm sure you know, as entrepreneurs. But I think the important point here is that it's about informing the team, discussing things, bringing things forward um, that can help success. And I think a particular note is entrepreneurs, the buck stops with you, with training the team, building bridges, uh, resilience and protecting creativity. So now looking at uh, business side of things. So I think it's really important to look at each aspect of your business, include creativity, business development, marketing, sales, but then also look at how they work together and how they can affect each other. What I think also is important is creative resilience. How do you protect your resilience and how do you ring out the best in yourselves and i think have a little think about when you've been at your best as entrepreneurs on your own but also have a think as a team when have you been at your best 
and the business, when has the business been at its best? And then have a little think about who are you working with? What was the environment like? Were there any outside factors? What was happening in your personal life? Were there things that were affecting you? Was it particularly good, particularly bad? And were your core values and needs being met? Um, there was a really interesting um, uh, idea that one um, CEO told me, which was that um, once a week he has a get together for half an hour to do something completely different, non-work, well, generally non-work related for half an hour. And he takes, uh, he asks people to bring come up with different ideas. Um, anyway, one of the ideas that happened was that everybody, um, they visualize um, how they viewed the company as a whole. So some of them, uh, but it's just, it was either a photo or a painting. So some of them would actually paint themselves or sketch out themselves. Other people would put photographs together on a little PowerPoint slide. And what he said was really, really interesting was that he could see from those photographs and from those paintings, how people viewed the business. And there are things that came out that he hadn't quite sort of realized. But I think it comes back to thinking, when are you at your creative back? best but also when have you been at your worst when have you really really struggled and have a think the reasons behind that what was your behavior what your emotions um, and what was your um yeah your all-round um being so some key takeaways um i've got from this number one mindset there are things that you can do to build resilience at an individual a team and a business level and it's coming up with a plan and that starts with the, you, the entrepreneur. And I think you can be very creative about these things. Number two, have a plan, personal, team, and business levels. Number three, learn from others. And I think there is so much experience out there. And so often, if you have a problem, if you're struggling, you're most likely not the first person to have had that. And often it's the who, it's not the how. So by speaking to people, advice, I think that's um, it's a really interesting and it's a powerful thing to do. So the overarching is how you can affect the mindset and the mindset of your team to affect the business in short. What I'm gonna do now is leave you with one quote. Uh, and I think it's such an important thing that is linked directly to mindset. Um, and it's by someone who was considered a terrorist who spent 27 years in jail and then went on to lead his country and inspire the world. I never fail, either I win or I learn. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for this, Milo. It's been, uh, it's been insightful. And actually I was, uh, I was making a note um, about how we, we initially got got in touch after your your DAT talk. It was uh, because you were talking about uh, setting up a routine and waking up at four p four a.m. And I asked you what happens if you can't wake up at four a.m. I think you said it's important that you have a routine and that you understand how that centers you. Yeah, completely. And I think <clears throat> obviously getting up at four a.m. doesn't work for absolutely everybody. Um, but I think it is, like you say, is having a routine, knowing what, what works best for you as an individual. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, I think that's, that's very important, especially as we, we created new routines uh, since the lockdown. Um, but before, before I go further into my list of questions, I'm just going to remind folks that they can use the Q&A uh, Q function on Zoom in order to ask questions, and we'll be taking those uh, as they come through. So from from my point of view, I thought it was uh, it, it was really really interesting uh, to learn about resilience, and I think that's something that you naturally build as uh, as you go through failures or as you go through moments of of intense pressure. So what I wanted to ask you is, do you think it's okay to take time off after you go through through a failure, or through a series of failures, or through some moments of intense pressure, and just be able to reflect on this and process what's happened to be able to understand what you learned? I do. I think it's really important to do that sometimes, and we all need at times just to have a bit of a break. 
time out just to reset, recharge. But that's something I think is really important that if it's something that's you know has has been very has affected you deeply um and it's been particularly very traumatic that there's various research that shows that if you speak about these things within hours with other people who've been through similar then actually the way you recover how it affects you is uh yeah it affects you less effectively but i think it's so important to have time out um, and it's all too easy to get consumed um, in what you're doing and yeah, forget about looking after yourself. Mm. Definitely. No, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that. We have a comment from Persis uh, on the chat saying that you changed, changed their life with, with your knowledge a few years ago. Thank you very much, Persis. I'm, yeah, I'm very humbled by that and yeah, very inspired by what you're doing with, uh, with your company as well. Mm. Thank you. Speaking of speaking of career changes and then like life changing moments, a lot of the time as a creative entrepreneur, um, starting your own business means throwing away or putting aside uh, what could be seen as a stable life and a, and a stable uh, income, and then going into something where you don't know how your income is going to look like two, three five six months down the line so i wanted to to ask you how long did you take to to start your own uh your own business and how you spent that time uh in order to understand what would work and what wouldn't work for you really interesting and i'm sure yeah interesting to hear other people's you know how they've done it as well but i know we sort of i gave myself a couple of months out having left a job i didn't really like to think about what I wanted to do in my career. Um, and probably within about, so probably about two months, I'd met my future business partners. And we, we had a number of, um, of meetings all in the park, funnily enough, in beautiful park in London, St. James's Park, um, lots of greenery, beautiful lakes. Um, and it's, we sort of worked out how we, what we wanted to, yeah, what we wanted to do and we were sort of quite clear very early on that it was about helping individuals it was you know challenging times you know particularly with changing careers or you know having problems at work it's about the individual it's about helping them get through that so that was the very at the very heart of what we did it was that was it and then we sort of structured it so the other two had uh, other jobs and so i um i sort of started the company up but with their support and what i found particularly was that I would have found it a lot tougher on my own if it had been just me on my own. But having two others bounce ideas off, for me, that was really important. And I think it's, you know, I'm very impressed by people who start companies on their own. But I think for me, I don't know if I would have done it on my own, but I think it just gave me that sort of nudge that there was others there as well. Um, so, yeah. No, I think <clears throat> I think that's, uh, that's very interesting. A lot of the time, uh, and this is something that we discussed with with uh, our previous uh, digital summer digital session speaker Fraser. A lot of the time, creating a good business idea takes time, and it's it's going to take a lot of time to build contacts. It's going to take a lot of time to to find potential co-founders, even uh, and and to work everything out with them. So it's not necessarily something that you start. You know, you start now, and then by Monday next next morning, you're already funded. Mm. Yeah, I think so the really interesting thing, particularly about getting contacts, and I hate the term networking. I've always, yeah, but anyway, I've always seen it's having chats with people. But I think the wonderful thing about networking is that it's not, uh, you're not just networking for now. You're networking for 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And I'm a great believer in what goes around comes around. And so I think, you know, it is, there's that old adage, the journey of a thousand miles starts with one small step. Mm. Taking those first steps often, I think, is the most difficult part of that. But I think, again, it is, yeah, it is daunting. And, you know, having worked with other entrepreneurs who've done it and been through it, it's a daunting time because there's a lot of uncertainty. 
It is. And a lot of the time, folks around you who might have those stable jobs won't necessarily, or long-term jobs, won't necessarily understand the types of things that you're going through. And I think there's, uh, there's a book written about this, about how it's only going to be other, other founders or other executives who are going to be able to, to understand what you're going through, not necessarily your employees once your company is at a bigger stage. Mm. Um, so something that I thought uh, I thought it would be interesting to um, to, to further explore is you mentioned uh, you mentioned the um, activity where you talk about the cost of having self doubt, for example, and and how you should try and provide proof of that, and that's uh, that that's a very good gotcha uh and that's when you realize that actually you know that's been costing you a lot but you don't really have any proof to to back that self-doubt something that i wanted to ask you here is how is if you have any tips on how coming back from a negative spiral so a lot of the time uh, at least this was the case for me as as the lockdown started i was struggling with sleep i was having a lot of stress from the media around me and then i saw every minor failure uh, either prof personal or professional you know uh, arguing with my partner or or uh, missing a task or a deadline in, in, in my work life as compounding each other. But obviously those weren't necessarily related. Those were just individual instances. Do you have any thoughts on coming back from a negative spiral and not letting that affect you and your self-worth? Yeah, I think it's very, very tough. And most of us have been in downward spirals thinking how on earth can we get out of here? But I think, you know, there are things you can do to help and may not necessarily you know, be the complete clincher, but I think the mindset is really important. And I think this whole thing of viewing things, not as failures, but as learnings is such an important thing and thinking, what can I learn from this? Um, and of course, it's very easy to say when you're not in a downward sp spiral, but I think again, speaking to people again, you know, it happened funny enough. It was uh, about a month into lockdown. I was worrying about a few things with work and I had a chat with one of my colleagues, one of the other deal makers at the GEP. Um, and we just had a great chat and it was nothing to do with work at all, but it just lifted me. It completely lifted me. And I do think having that personal, um, yeah, sort of interaction is really important. And particularly, you know, when so many people are locked down, it's important, but it's just thinking, what can I do? How have I coped in the past? And thinking creatively about what you can do just to try and help and go forward. And giving yourself a break sometimes as well. You know, sometimes just nice to not be too harsh on ourselves. And we tend to be our harshest critics, our own harshest critics. Yeah, that's that's very, very easy to, to, to um, go into and just criticize ourselves. Uh, very harshly. So I think Sarah is asking a question following this question. Uh, should you let go of of outcomes during COVID? And I think here uh, she's trying to talk about uh, the goals uh, or business goals that we set ourselves or personal goals. So if mm. you could uh, clarify a little bit, that would be good. What you mean by outcomes? So outcomes with... Let's see what, what she says. Because for, for me, yeah, it, it, once lockdown started, kind of my productivity went down the drain. <laughs> um, and I think that's, uh, you know, it, it's important to realize that we are still in the middle of a global pandemic and we shouldn't mm. be too hard on ourselves. Uh, was it a question in the text box, Chris? Uh, no, it's a question in the Q&A panel. Oh, I can't quite see it. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm just going to press okay. answer live, and that should pop up in in the answered category there. Um, but I, while while uh, while we wait for this, something that I that I feel is um, the related to this and you touched on is uh decentering stress and i was just wondering if you could expand a bit upon uh upon that yeah well i think it's one of those things that it's it's you know what we tell children when they're young use your words use your words if you're angry don't hit your sister um use your words to describe it instead 
and again, you know, this applies, you know, to adults as well, that if you label the emotions you're feeling, it activates the thinking side of your brain, not the emotional side. Mm. And so it's, uh, I think it's just being able to do that, take a step back, labeling it, recognizing this is how I'm feeling. It will pass, but this is uh, how I'm feeling at this very moment and acknowledging that and thinking it's okay to feel that, you know, other people have, I've felt it before, but come through. Um, but of course, it's there's so much and so many different sort of elements uh, to stress. But I, th- I do think understand what it is, and uh, yeah, the sort of reasons behind it um, are really important. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot for for explaining that. Yeah, I, I've definitely been in that situation myself. Uh, before we go further, I'll just uh, post the link uh, to the feedback form in chat. It would be absolutely great, as I said before, if you could just take a couple of minutes before you leave and uh, just fill in this this short feedback form. Um, <clears throat> it, it's definitely going to help us. And, and as I said, we'll share uh, some of the feedback with, with Milo. Uh, it, it was really great to hear feedback from the other, the other event that we put together. Uh, some of the feedback was there should be more time for Q&A, which is why we now have more time for Q&A. Um, so uh, one other thing that I wanted to, to ask um, Milo is, when you talk about businesses should be showcasing their vision, I thought it was really, uh, it was such an interesting idea to have Great a company. Idea, isn't it? Yeah, to have your company's vision as, as a picture, as a painting, and you can just imagine you walking into the office so, and just having a, a giant mural uh, showing the, the company's values. I was wondering if you saw any good examples of smaller businesses uh, doing that. Uh, so somebody who's not, not at the level of Google or Facebook who have their own pillars and everything else uh, all over the internet, because uh, it, it can be a costly exercise to, to sit down and write down your values and then maybe commission someone to, to put them in a really nice visual form. Uh, because uh, in addition to your employees uh, benefiting from knowing what the company vision is, your clients also benefit from that. Because the, yeah. the more, the more uh, companies are seen as having certain values uh, that aren't business focused, the sometimes the more valuable uh, that company is going to be in the eyes of a potential customer. Hmm. I think it's a really interesting one, you know, the whole values and the culture. Um, and obviously for some people, it's more important than others. And you know it's well documented how important it is. But I think for certain people and certain um, companies, it is more um, important than others. And there's one uh, Colombian company that uh, I do some work with. Their culture, their values, is very 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 clear what that is and he's absolutely adamant that is going to stay at all costs but you know he's <clears throat> yeah it's something that he spends a lot of time thinking about and of course you know as um you know you're all entrepreneurs there's so many different things to juggle at the same time of course there is but it's about prioritizing and realizing i suppose what for you is the most important thing you know, is values at a given time is that really the most important thing or is it a high priority or is it something that can wait but i think i would suggest that you know the research that's been done is that it is very important and if people understand what those values are truly what they are um that that helps mm. thank you for that uh, it, how how does the entrepreneur uh, that you're talking about in in Colombia uh, talk about those values, or how how does he uh, make sure that his employees know about them and know what they are? Well, I think that you know there's a lot of you know they have meetings where they talk through what it is. He asks them, do they understand you know what the values are? And I suppose it's demonstrating it in your day-to-day behavior as well and how you go about your business. And you know, if someone steps off the mark, you'll have quite a frank conversation with them, not necessarily a nasty one, but just talking it through. And you know, if someone you know slightly slips off the rails, you know, he's there to talk to them, you know, understanding it at an empathetic level. But also to say, do you know what? That's not on. And that's you know very specific, and it's something that's quite difficult to do. Some people find it easier, other people don't. Um, but I, again, it's I think it's an individual thing, you know, that with the entrepreneur, with yeah, with the individual entrepreneur. Cool. Thanks a lot for that. And I think the last question that we have is from Becky. Do you believe it's possible to completely overcome imposter syndrome, or at least be able to deal it with it, deal with it well enough that it no longer negatively affects you in day-to-day life? 
Do you know, it's a great question. And I think, to be honest, it depends on the individual. But I think going through the sort of little tool about challenging, working out what the cost was for the limiting self-belief and then the proof. And you know, it'll probably always be there to some degree. But I think acknowledging it, challenging it and thinking, you know, I have this belief, but actually I have no proof. I think that eases it a bit as well. But I think it's a natural thing that the vast majority of people do get limiting self-beliefs. And I've only met, ever met one person who hasn't, who doesn't get limiting self-beliefs. Um, but again, I think it's something that's, you know, it may never go, but I think that's okay. You can acknowledge it and you just think, I've seen it there. Other people get this too, but I'm going to ca carry on. And hopefully if you can use it as a way to propel you forward. That's, that's some very good advice. Uh, I think we got one more question in. Are there any hidden or overlooked pitfalls entrepreneurs face when building a business? It's from Ed. I think there's probably quite a few. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's one of those things. We've all made mistakes. Setting up businesses, we've made mistakes. But I think the key thing is learn from them. You know, if you make a mistake, learn from it. And I'm such a fan of people making mistakes, being empowered to make mistakes. Too often you find cultures in companies where there's, and you know, I've seen this as a, when I was a management consultant, they didn't want people making mistakes ever. You were jumped on if you made any mistakes. But actually, if you are free to make mistakes and you know that you make it once, but you learn from it and you grow and you pass on learnings to other people, I think it's such an important thing. So I think that's loads of pitfalls and we'll each make our own mistakes along the way, uh, depending what our sort of skills, strengths are. But I think it is learning, simple. View it as learning and embrace it. Mm. Thanks for that. I think it's equally as important to have making mistakes uh, and learning from them as part of your company culture, because just as you need to make mistakes and learn from them and, and live with them, as an entrepreneur, uh, it's just as important that your that to understand that your employees are going to be in the similar situations. Um, so, going back to to Becky's uh, question about uh, imposter syndrome, I just wanted to highlight that we do have an event coming up on the 9th of September, which is actually a workshop about dealing with the imposter with imposter syndrome. Uh, as part of the creatives program. So I've posted a link here and I just wanted to quickly explain uh, about that because you'll see that the event only has a wait list. The reason for that is because as uh, we get closer to the event, we only have a very limited number of, of spots for that uh, workshop because it's going to involve actively involve everybody who takes who's taking part in it and uh yeah so just please join the waitlist and uh when we get closer to the event uh in mid-august we'll probably follow up with everybody who joined the waitlist and ask them to fill in a more involved questionnaire uh just to see who's uh who can benefit the most out of that uh, so yeah, I've posted the link about that uh, in chat and I've, I'm also going to post the link for our next creative session, which is going to be in two weeks, uh, which is about speaking with confidence. So we have a great public speaker who's going to be joining us and she's going to be talking about how to pitch your business remotely, as well as some really great tips about public speaking in general. And I think that's about it for now, Milo. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. I've been, it's a great honor to come in here and chat and uh, yeah, I hope it's been of some use. I, I definitely, I, I definitely really, really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for your time. It's been great to see the activity in chat as well. It does seem that there were quite a few people who, who really enjoyed it as well. And hopefully we'll see this in the, in the feed, feedback form. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stop recording in a sec, but before I do that, I just wanted to, re to thank, uh, to thank you again for your time and to thank the folks at the Corchester Council for, for making this possible. Uh, and the Creators program is going to keep going on through the summer and up, uh, until September. So thank you everybody for taking part. I'm going to Thanks, stop recording Chris. now.